Well, good morning, everyone. And uh, this is the last study this week on uh, understanding the lines. And we're going to continue uh, where we left off yesterday. We're going to do a bit of a re review there just to show what we found. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much uh, for this morning, uh, for the things that you have taught us this past week, and as we look at some of these again, and as we continue to draw these things on the line, we ask for your wisdom and understanding. And we pray for each person. We know the struggles that uh, others face are not our struggles necessarily but we can all sympathize with the burdens that other people bear. We pray that your angels can be around them to strengthen them and that your Holy Spirit can speak to them and encourage them. Help us, Lord, and as you have been, as we face these trials. We pray for your Holy Spirit's presence in our lives, in our hearts, and in the midst of this study, as we open your word together. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the last uh, few days have been rather interesting uh, in what we have been studying here in Judges. And uh, so just a kind of a quick review. What we were doing is applying uh, the book of Judges based on Judges chapter 2 and how we saw that as representing the history of this movement from um, at least 9-11, if not 11-9, uh, 1989, um, to 2023. But we also have in here this that 2023 connects symbolically to this date, April 5th, 2030. And, and we keep ha having these connections. Um, and we already understood, even before we really started looking into this, uh, that... April 5th, 2030 was connected to 2023. And, and if you think about it too, 2030 and 23 are connected. Um, and it's the 2300 days that brings us to 2030. That is the 2300 days, um, go to 1844. And Samuel Snow counted 20, uh, 180 uh, six days, cardinal, 187, ordinal, uh, the Millerites did, from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. And then we found that if we counted 186 biblical years, that is, if you go from the first day of the first month in 1844 to the first day of the first month in 2030, you're counting just the same as if we counted, basically, that's a day for a year. So instead of getting to October 22nd, 1844, you'd get to April 5th, 2030, which also would be the first day of the first month, not the 10th day of the seventh month. It also happens to be exactly 2300 lunar months. So that's quite a remarkable uh, coincidence, you know, with scare quotes. And, and then also um, we know that uh, we found this in the week of Christ, First day of the first month, the week of Christ led to that date way back in 2018, but we ignored it. So it brought us to April 5th, 2030. And then we also had, um, uh, when we counted um, that in prophetic time from the first day of the first month in 1844 to the first day of the first month in 2030, it's 187 prophetic years and 20 prophetic months. And so we then had this date, which we connected all of these uh, events in our line to, and particularly was the end of Collins' prediction. Uh, but we also had this echo date of December 25th, 2022, and that also in Judges uh, chapter uh, 14 and other places too, where there's these 30, 30, 30s. Um, that that connects us to that date. We also had the book of Ezra 
that connected us to the first day of the first month. That is, we took from 9-11 uh, counting months in two different ways. That is, lunar months and also um, uh, prophetic months. And this would connect us to uh, 2030 as well, particularly April 3rd, April 5th, 2030. So we had all these different ways that we have come to that. Now, what we what we have here, um, so I'll just uh, bring up the chart. So in chapter 14, of course, we had come to see uh, the significance of Colin and Odilio's studies, the 49 days between them, and also um, that we could connect both January 11th, the end of Colin's prediction, and December 25th, 2022, which is the first day of the 10th month, we could connect this with the story of Ezra and the divorcement, and that would give us this April 5th, 2030 date in two different calculations from two different dates. And, and then we found that uh, Judges chapter 15, because it, it ties us to uh, the first fruits, and, and we're on the 20th day of the ninth month, which comes from the story of Ezra. And then we have um, this connection then to uh, with this 49 days that we had. So this is going to be Pentecost when um, Samson goes to see his wife. We looked at all these different connections, Timnath. We looked at the, um, the, the, the kid of the goats, which is this offering. Uh, we connected it to uh, uh, Genesis 38, I believe it was, uh, where we have some of the same symbols. Um, and then the response, because of this, um, he didn't divorce his wife, but there is a kind of a, a divorce that, in a sense that occurs because his wife is given to someone else. And then there his, is his response, which is this chiastic structure. So it's the taking of these 300 foxes and tying them tail to tail with the firebrand in the middle. And we can see in there a chiasm. He's going to let them run through the fields of wheat, which are going to burn down. And um, then we connected these 300 to the story of Noah, the two periods of 150 days with... Um, the first day of 10th month, not in the exact center of it, it's going to be 30 days later, but it's going to have this symbol. We, did, we didn't complete that, my ideas that I had regarding that. We sort of uh, went in other different directions. But my view is that when the tops of the mountains appear, that this is an understanding of prophecy because we have one of these primary symbols that Miller presents, you know, what is a mountain? Well, it's a government, right? So he's going to go through these different symbols. And uh, I think these symbols are significant in that they're the symbols that Miller, Miller's rules brings out. Um, and that rule was uh, rule number eight. Figures always have a figurative meaning and are used much in prophecy to re represent future Things, times, and events such as mountains, meaning governments. So that's the first thing he's going to bring up. Um, so he's got mountains, meaning governments, beasts, meaning kingdoms, waters, meaning people, lamp, meaning word of God, day, meaning year, right? So he uses these, these figures. And so the tops of the mountains appearing is, in my view, an understanding of Miller's rules that is being seen here. And, and we've already well established that the first day of the 10th month, all of this in the story of Ezra from uh, December 25th to 20, 2021 is connecting us um, all the way to this April 5th, 2030, which is the period of the divorcement, the three months from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month. Now, I also looked a little bit at um, Grace Amadon's dates for 457 B.C., and um, the significance of that really is, um, so I, I want to go there again. So I just want to ask people some questions regarding this. So this, this to me is an important point. It might have 
know, because I've dwelt on it a lot over the years. You know, I know to me it's very meaningful, may not be as meaningful to other people. But let's take a look at this. And um, so here we have a Grace Amada date, Amadon's dates, Amadon's dates for uh, 457 BC. So she's going to see the first day of the first month when Ezra leaves Babylon as Thursday, March 28th, 457 BC. Right. So she is not going to be placing an extra month at the end of the Jewish year 458 BC. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists, uh, in establishing 457 BC as the start of the 70 weeks and the 2300 days, what do we have to do with the start of the year in 457 BC? So we know that Artaxerxes, that his journey or, or that the journey of Ezra happens in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, how did Artaxerxes count his reign? When, when does he count the years of his reign? Which month begins the beginning of his count? How did the Persians count their... their Rainal years, which month? Spring to spring. Okay, so they go spring to spring. So Nisan 1 is going to be the first day of the next count of uh, Artaxerxes years. And, and Ezra leaves on the first day of the first month in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. Now, the seventh year of Artaxerxes can be objectively proven to be from Nisan 1, 458 to Nisan 1, 457. It is we have all kinds of documentation that shows how Artaxerxes counted the years of his reign, because we also have um, the Egyptian dates on many of these documents at that period of time. Um, so it's quite easy to show that he counted his reign spring to spring. Now, since he counted his, his, his the years of his reign spring to spring, um, if Ezra is leaving in 457 BC, and he says it's the first day of the first month. He's, of course, counting the Jewish years, the first day of the first month, right? So he's going to be counting in the spring, but it's in 457. Now, he is not using the Babylonian calendar, right? Because if he was using the Babylonian calendar, um, the first day of the first month would have been March 27th, 457 BC, where he's going to have the first day of the first month as April 26, 457 BC. Now, Grace Amadon is uh, counting the first day of the first month as March 28th. That is, she's going one day later than the Babylonian calendar. And when she does that, she is not using the visible crescent to mark the start of the month. She's using the 15th day of the month. Nisan has to be the day after the full moon. So this is something she applies in the time of Christ, which we believe is actually how they did it in the time of Christ. And there's lots of evidence for that. But they didn't do it at that, that way at this time. They would have just used the month's as observed by the visible crescent. And so when uh, Ezra is counting the months, the start of the month, he's going to use the numbering of the people around him. But as far as counting the year, he's going to be counting it after the spring equinox. Now, the reason that she, um, one of the reasons that she addresses this is she wants to show that these events do not fall on the Sabbath, the, the events of a journey, because you're not going to be traveling. You're not going to be starting your journey on a Sabbath. You're not going to come and arrive on a Sabbath, you know, um, because you're not going to be traveling on the Sabbath. And so she shows here that they don't do any of this on a Sabbath, except that um, 
for this date here, which is going to be the fourth date. So on the fourth day, they bring the silver and gold to the temple. That's in Ezra 8, 33. Uh, she's going to make it the fifth day so that it's a Sunday. So she, she fudges here to get this to work. Now, when I had done it, I also can show that these events don't fall on a Sabbath, but I follow the biblical example of a fourth being an ordinal count. And that also happens to be a Sunday. Of course, it's a month later, right? So you can see that these dates here are a month apart. Now, as far as the start of the next year, we're basically going to be on the same page. She puts Tuesday or Wednesday. I'm not sure why. 456 BC. I put Tuesday, April 15th, 456 BC. And that's when the divorce proceedings end. Right now, you know, that's going to be a Tuesday. This is going to be a Friday. They're not, not going to start the divorce proceedings on a Sabbath. And, and they're not going to end them on a Sabbath. Right. So nothing here falls on a Sabbath. All these things that. Uh, and and. Here, you know, you can see the within three days, that's going to be a Monday. So that uh, that inviting of the people within three days, it, you know, it could have occurred. It could have occurred on a Sabbath that people were heard of it, but it probably, uh, you know, could have been. I don't know. It's hard to say how what that within three days means specifically. But I have a Monday, January 6th is the 20th day of the ninth month. Now, um, so, so if we look at, because uh, I'm trying to tie a bunch of things together here, so I've got to think exactly where I want to go. So I think people understand this, that if we were going to use Grace Amadon's structure, a lot of the things dealing with uh, the study of the 70 weeks falls apart. Um, it's too long a period. You end up with um, uh, the connection of the length of time of the 70 weeks and how it fits structurally together. It falls apart. I'm not going to go into the details of that right now. Um, but when we have, if, if, if Ezra is using the Babylonian calendar, um, he would not... It's unlikely that he would have called it the seventh year of Artaxerxes on the first day of the first month. So what they're going to do is they're going to count fall to fall for Artaxerxes' reign. That's one of the things that Adventists have taken that position. So when it says it's in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, the seventh year of Artaxerxes is going to end in the fall as far as the Jews are concerned. Right. So when he says, I left on the first day of the first month in the seventh year of Artaxerxes, well, it's not the first day of the first month that the Babylonians observed because they observed March 27th. But he's going to be talking about the first day of the first month on the biblical calendar, which is Friday, April 26, 457 BC, right? So he's going to begin his journey, right? They're going to meet at the River Ahava. So that's going to take, you know, nine days or so, 10 days. And then they're going to have this uh, three days fast at the River Ahava. And you can see they're going to leave on a Tuesday. So, you know, it's, if they're leaving on a Tuesday, that means that three day fast was Sabbath, Sunday, and Monday, right? Yeah. Okay. Which, which makes a lot of sense that they're going to, they're going to get there. On this Friday, they're going to have this three-day fast, so they probably get there Friday evening. They have this three-day fast, sa Sabbath, Sunday, and Monday, and then they're going to leave on the Tuesday. So they're not leaving on the third day. They're going to have a three-days fast, and, and they're going to have to, when they get there, so they get there on a Friday, and they find out there's no Levites. That would have been on the Sabbath, and then on Sunday, they're going to send back to get some Levites. And they're going to probably arrive Monday, and then they're going to leave on Tuesday. That's that's the way that I would understand this. Um, and uh, there might it, be a like the logistics of that. You know, you you say they left in the first day of the first month, and then yeah. like they're traveling, they're traveling for like nine days. 
Yeah. But then they're going to get the Levites there in like in a day or two. Okay. So they're coming from different locations. So Ezra himself, we, wherever Ezra was, because they're going to meet at the River Ahava, which is way up north, right, in Babylon. Um, correct? You know where the River Ahava is, at least where they I'm not really sure, no. So he's going to be further down south. And, and so this is just a meeting point. So there's, there's Jews all over the area. Right, because they're they're in captivity in Babylon, sort of, you know, it is a captivity. But you know, they were spread out throughout Babylon. So, yeah. So they're obviously um, Ezra's talking about his own particular journey, and Ezra would have been where? Where was he? Um, do we know where particularly he was? Babylon. Okay, he's in Babylon, but. Where in Babylon do we know? The city of Babylon. Okay, so in the city of Babylon. So the city of Babylon is how far south? From where? Well, from the river Ahava. It's it's quite nine a way. Nine days journey. Yeah, it, it's pretty far, right? So it's it's not. It's not it's not close. Now you also have other cities, of course, that are closer to the river Ahab. Right. So in, in getting some Levites, they're not going to go all the way back to Babylon. Right. Because they, they only have three days. So now now there are other options. I mean, the three days are mentioned, and we put the three days before the 12 days. Um, because that seems to be the logical way to do it uh, based on how the story is told. I mean, there's other options of how to look at where those three days are. But since they're going to leave on this uh, Tuesday, um, it just seems likely that this is what's going to happen. They're going to they're going to just go get some people that are nearby. They're not going to go look all over the all over the country of Babylon. They're not going to go back to the city of Babylon. So um, no matter how you sort of put it together, it would be, um, I mean, there are possibilities, you know, that they get there, you know, in a few days, they have this three-day fast, but the way it's all laid out in the story, it doesn't appear to be that way, that there's, that, you know, there's sort of halfway there that they go back. Does that make sense? Because yeah, I've thought about yeah. this. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's sort of a. I, I can see that being the sort of an option that fits. Yeah, I mean, because it's obviously a muster point, right? I mean, they meet at the river Ahava, so the word must have gone out. We're going to be going. We're going to be going back to Jerusalem. We're going to be leaving Babylon. Um, and, and Ezra is going to be leaving with some people, but they're all going to meet at the river Ahava. So these people must be coming from different locations. I mean, that's the only way that I could see that it works, uh, especially this idea of the meeting somewhere. And, and then he's going to find out there's no Levites, because if they all left with, with Ezra right from the first day of the first month, I think he would know that right away. Well, he himself was a Levite. Yes, I understand that. But they need some Levites to go back with them. They're, and, and the question is, why particularly? I mean, they have priests. You know, why does he have to go back and get Levites anyway? I mean, there's, there's Levites in Jerusalem. Anybody ever thought about that? No, I haven't. I, I've tried to figure it out myself, but I, I, I don't know particularly why, unless there must have been a need for Levites that he knew about, right? So, you know, in Ezra 7, 1, like the subheading they have here, Ezra sent to teach the people. 
Um, right. So Ezra went up from Babylon. He was already scribing the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests. So this request. Maybe, maybe to have teaching on the journey. Um, to have teaching on the journey, maybe. Um, so this was in response to the third decree, correct? Yes. So that's the thing that I'm trying to show here. So when you when you go back and you read like Ezra six, you're going to have the decree of Dar Darius. They're going to talk about the celebration of the Passover. And then you jump to Ezra 7, and it doesn't give you any background here, what's happening. Like, we know there's a decree of Artaxerxes. Um, so King Artaxerxes gives him a letter. Now, a lot of times we sort of, in our mind, we, we kind of conflate this story of Ezra and Nehemiah. I, I see it all the time in Adventist literature. But it doesn't, it doesn't really tell us how the decree of Artaxerxes comes about. Like we don't have a background story here. So, okay, and, but the yeah, point that I was trying to make. Yeah, that the Levites need to be instructing them. No. No. You have, okay, we, we have this first degree, first decree, and we have a second decree. Yeah. Both of those decrees were they not to rebuild the temple? Yeah, and the temple is rebuilt under Darius's decree. Okay, but the third decree was the one that established that they would rebuild the temple and the city, the streets and the walls. Okay, so the third decree says nothing about the, um, the rebuilding of the temple. But it's under the third decree that we find that the streets and the walls are being rebuilt. Well, that would be under the fourth decree. And the fourth decree was issued by, by whom? Artaxerxes in the 20th year of his reign. Okay. So that's 13 years later. Yeah. Yeah so, no, no, yeah, so no background information is given regarding how come Ezra's all of a sudden has this decree of Artaxerxes. So there's no story connected with it. We're just given Artaxerxes' decree. We're seeing that Ezra is going to leave from Babylon. And it says there went up some of the children of Israel, priests and the Levites, singers, porters, and ethnonyms unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes' decree. Artaxerxes the king. He came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which is in the seventh year of the king. So this fifth year in the, in the fifth month in the seventh year of the king is counting his reign fall to fall rather than spring to spring. And it says, for upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem according to the good hand of his God upon him. Right? So I mean, it's going to be a period of, of four months that it takes them to go from Babylon when they begin their journey to when they arrive at Jerusalem. And, uh, you know, we see similar things also with uh, Nehemiah in, in as far as the time of the journey and so forth. Now, he has this copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe of the words of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes to Israel. So you're going to have Artaxerxes' decree. And um, when you read the decree here, this is going to be, I mean, he's going to provide all of this, this gold and silver and all of these different things for the temple, right? Um for the worship of God there in Jerusalem. But what's going to be done, the, the thing that's actually done, also we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites sing report, there shall be no toll. Where is this next part? Okay. And thou, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, 
all such as know the laws of thy God and teach ye them, teach, teach ye them that know them not. And whosoever will not do the law of th thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death, to banishment, to, or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. So this is really what is the heart of this decree. They're setting up the civil authority. And he's going to give them all these different things to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. So the temple has already been built, you know, in 515 BC, right? It's going to be dedicated, right? It's, it's going to be completed under Darius', Darius decree that happens in the summer of 516. And by um, March 12th, 515, they're going to have the dedication of that temple. And then they're going to keep the Passover 40 days later. Right, that's Ezra chapter 6. So there's going to be a beautifying of the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. But this seems to be more about setting up this civil authority in Jerusalem. That now they are being given their own government. Right, And that's why you know Adventists always argue, well, we take the third decree because that's the one that addresses the temple. And... But it doesn't, you know, it's Darius's decree and, and Cyrus's decree that addressed the building of the temple. I mean, there's a completion of the temple under these three kings in the sense that, you know, there's a beautification of the house of the Lord. But this is not the temple's operative already. So you already have priests and Levites. You know, you have people working in the temple. The temple is operating. They already had a Passover there. Um, what, however many years that is, what, 80 years or something earlier. Or is it, wait, let me think, 457, that's 53 plus 15. So that's going to be um, 53 plus 15. How many years is that? Fifteen. What's that? Fifty-eight, something like that. Sixty-eight. Sixty-eight. Okay. Sixty-eight. Is that sixty-eight? Yeah, sixty-eight years earlier. Okay, that makes sense. <clears throat> so anyway, you have. Um, so you've already had the temple operating. Um, Four fifty-seven. So that'd be forty-three. No, forty-three plus fifteen. So that's fifty-eight. It's 58 years. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So, so you've already had this temple operating under a, since the time of Darius, and now you're going to have this um, this decree, which has nothing to do with the temple other than to beautify it, right? So the temple's already operating. But it's the civil authority that needs to be set up. Now, in Artaxerxes' second decree, the streets and walls are going to be built. Now, the streets are a symbol of um, organization and structure. So we don't quite understand the significance of streets in that sense. Uh, but with the Persian Empire, because um, this is under the time of Persia, the Persian Empire, what was the main reason that Persia was able to build an empire? Because th their empire is different than the Empire of Babylon. Their empire is different than the Empire of Rome, though Rome utilizes some of their uh, ideas. But why did Persia primarily have this huge empire? What allowed them to do that? Anybody know? Because if you think about an empire, I mean, it's easy to go and conquer some city, but how are you going to hold that city to be a part of your empire? What are you going to have to do? I mean, the Babylonians, they just had a protection racket. Persia didn't. And the Babylonian Empire was really just uh, collecting money from these 
nations around you that uh, that you were protecting, you know, from their enemies, which of course you were their enemy. So what would you need in order for an empire to grow and build and 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 be sustained for a long period of time? Don't you need an infrastructure? So what the Persians did is they built roads. Right, the king's highways. Why is that important? Why, why does that help the empire? Anybody? Anybody got that? Controversy. If it's for um, hauling goods up and down it, where you can get to one place to another. Right. So you got goods. So you need, you need, of course, the economic part of that. And, and so you need to have travel. And Persia built amazing roads. So these roads allowed them, um, and these roads were protected. So you need to have roads that are protected so that people can transport goods and that their goods aren't going to be robbed all the time. Because you're not going to go out there and start transporting something without any sort of protection. So these roads... You need the military. Uh, the military also travels on these roads as well as commerce. So in order to have a large country, you need the military, you need transportation. And then people benefit from belonging to the Persian empire. Now the Persian empire is more like the United States. Right, so you have all these independent places. That's why uh, Xerxes in Ezra chapter one, he has to bring all these different officials from these different places and, and basically uh, plan this war against Greece, right? So he can't just, even though as the king, he has all kinds of power, um, he can't just exercise that power at will. Um, he still has to negotiate. Right. All kinds of negotiations need to go on. So it's a very different government from what you would have had in Babylon. Um, so, so anyway, that's what's happening. Now, as far as them then setting up their own uh, magistrates and judges, do we see why this is important for how the Persians operate? And, and you can even go back to see how Cyrus and Darius operated because they have this, this Persian empire and it's an empire that's built upon having all of these separate independent governments working together. And so to have the, the temple in Jerusalem built, rebuilt, to have the Jews return to their land, to set up these governments, this is all necessary in order for uh, Judea and Jerusalem to become part of this empire. So we can see why the Levites are important in this decree, because they're part of this, this government, so to speak. Does that make sense to people? So, so in the story of Ezra, we just have this out of context, you know, all of a sudden there's this decree, but it's not like he's having to, you know, going to have to convince King Artaxerxes. We don't know exactly why this is that Artaxerxes gives this decree. We don't know what initiates it, but this would be just part of the way that Artaxerxes was running his government. You have this country, you have the city, um, we've already built the temple there, but it's not restored after Babylon had, 
you in captivity. And so they're going to be completing this work that had begun under previous Persian rulers. And, and this is often just not even really talked about. I mean, most Adventists don't think about these things. Um, and, and especially the real problem is that this is not about rebuilding the temple. I, I mean, I thought that until I was in this movement and studied this, I always thought it was Artaxerxes' decree that the temple is going to be rebuilt under Artaxerxes' decree. Even though once you read the spirit of prophecy, you know, you, you start to realize that that's not what happens. But, um, but when I read it before, it just didn't. They were all kind of mixed together, all these stories in my mind. And I think with most Adventists who I look at these stories, they have no idea really how to distinguish Ezra and Nehemiah and what they, what they accomplished. So, so we know all three decrees are needed. And this, this is part of a revelation that this movement has in how we understand these decrees and how they commence the 2300 days and the 70 weeks. Now, why are we on this path right now? Why are we studying this in the context of judges? What is the significance here? Uh, we were dealing with, of course, Ezra chapter 7 to 10. And we're going to look at these periods of three days, right? The river Ahava. And we have the three days that are going to happen at the end, right? In chapter 10. And how this, how is this then connected with our understanding of things? I know that's a lot of connections, a lot of things you have to sort of pull together. <clears throat> so we know that this first day of the first month is going to be the end of this, this year. It's going to start on the first day of the first month, right? Which we can line up with 9-11, 9-11 being the first day of the first month. And this whole year of Ezra, is going to end on the first day of the first month in 2030. That is, if we start at 9-11 and we count the number of days, 354, and we use them as months, it's going to bring us to April 5th, 2030. Right? That's going to be the end. This is going to be the beginning of the next year. Right? The 354th day is going to be the month before that. Right? So... 9-11, September 11th, 2001, is going to happen in the first day of the first month, right? It's going to start on August 22nd, uh, 2001. That's when the first day of the first month is. If we count 354 months, the first month is that month in which 9-11 occurs. And, and these are lunar months. And then you're going to have 354 of these, and the 354th is the last day of the year. And that's going to end on April 4th, 2030. That's going to be the last day of those 354 months. And then April 5th, 2030 is going to be the first day of the first month. Is that making sense? to Anybody not understand that? Okay, so now if we understand that we have the, that this we can connect 9-11 in our history with April 5th, 2030 by just taking the year of Ezra. Now the last three months, if we take um, these lunar months, the last three months are going to be um, uh, so we're going to take how we're going to do this. So we're going to take 88 days and we're going to take 88 days and multiply them by the 30, the prophetic month. And if we do that, that goes from January 11th, 2023 to April 5th, 2030. So that's going to be 88 months, uh, prophetic months. But we're taking those 88 days that from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month. Now, if we take them as 30 day months, in the story of Ezra, even though it's not, there's two 29 day months, and one 30 day month. But if we took them all as 30 days and we get that symbol, then, and we multiply them by the length of a month, 
So we, again, we're, we're going to be now using lunar months mixed with prophetic months in both of these cases, but doing it the other way around. We're going to go from December 25th, 2022 to April 5th, 2030. So, but December 25th, 2022 is the first day of the 10th month on the biblical calendar. So, so we end up with this um, two different ways of doing it, and we still arrive at the same date. So we can take this story of Ezra, but if we're starting it, we're going from 9 11 to 2030, right? We're going from, from this period. And, and if you look at that, 9 11 to 2030 is how many years? And 2001. It's from 2001 to 2030. 29. So, so we got these 29 years, which is a short month, right? So months can either be 29 days or 30 days, average 20, 29 and a half. Um, so it ends up being this symbol of, of a month as well. So, I mean, it can be this year of Ezra, but it can also be uh, a month. So there's lots of ways in which we can we can look at these, um, this 2030. So this April 5th, 2030 is a very interesting date. It has all of these different ties to these different symbols. But again, we don't know what it means. That is, I don't, I don't believe that we should ever try to predict what's going to happen on that date. I mean, I think what we've been clearly shown is that we can't do that. And that what we're doing is watching and waiting. Now, there is that statement in uh, Second Ezra's uh, where it talks about you're going to measure the time, and when the time is passed, you will see that it is the time. I can't remember the exact words, but this is what we're doing. We're measuring the time. We're just looking at these structures. We're seeing them as symbols. And then after they pass, we will recognize the significance of those dates. And, and we can see that in watching and waiting, that's all that we can do. God's not going to give us more light than we need for our feet. So now when we go to these, um, the tops of the mountains, right, the first day of the 10th month, um, we know that in the story of Noah, it's going to talk about seeing the tops of the mountains on the first day of the 10th month. So let's, let's go to the story of Noah, because we know that the story of Noah is connected with this history, right? Because of a number of things. It's going to give us in chapter eight, um, um, End at 150 days, the ark rested in the seventh month and the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. The waters decreased continually until the 10th month, in the 10th month on the first day of the month, were the tops of the mountains seen. So you're going to see a month later, after they come to the mountains of Ararat, um, that, uh, and this is going to happen after the waters. Uh, assuaged and, and they were abated so i'm gonna have to get here i know not everybody's super familiar with all of these dates um but what you're gonna have here so i'll go to this other paper we can see this here so this is uh the 600th year of noah's life the first day of the first month the 600th year of Noah's life is going to be September 13th, 2391 BC. And here I'm using a month based upon the full moon as being uh, the 14th day of the month. So the 15th day of the month is the day after the full moon. And, and this is, I believe, is how they would have originally counted the months uh, because it's, it's much, much more universal. It's easier to do. Um, and then you're going to have, you know, the animals gathering. There's these two periods of seven days. The door of the ark is going to close midway 
So there's seven days, the animals come in, the door of the ark closes on Sabbath, October 22, 2391 BC. And then seven days later, the rains begin, right? So on the eighth day, Ella White says, from when the doors close, uh, the rain's going to begin. So that's going to be October 29th, 2391 BC, the 17th day of the second month. And then uh, the rain's going to end on the, on the 26th day of the third month, December 7th, 2391 BC. And then we count 150 days. This is the first day, right? So that's the zeroth day. Um, and um, so the first day, and you're going to count 150 days that the waters prevail. So they're going to end on Sabbath, May 6th, 2039. So, um, and then you're going to have the waters abate here on the 30th day of the eighth month. That's going to be May 7th. So you can see May 6th. That's the last day the waters prevail. And then the waters begin to abate on May 7th. And then on September 2nd, 2390 BC, that's going to be um, where the waters no longer are abating. The waters are gone off the earth. But before that, the tops of the mountains appear. So this is the eighth month, 30th day. And then you're going to have 30 days to the 10th day of the first month, or the first day of the 10th month, pardon me. And then they're going to have this 40-day period. And then they're going to let the raven out, then the dove out, then the dove out, then the dove out. There's four times that these are released. It's a period of three weeks, 21 days. And, and that's, they're always going to let it out on a Sunday. All right, so on the Sunday, they're going to release these animals. It's the first day of the week. And then the first day of the first month is mentioned here. Um, and that's 813. So in... Genesis 8.13, we have the first day of the first month being mentioned. So is this significant? And this is going to be when they're going to take the, the roof of the ark off. The waters are dried from off the earth. He's going to remove the roof of the ark. In Uncle Arthur's Bible story books, it says, you know, it was his birthday. And so to make the day special, they removed the roof of the ark. Um, but it's going to be the first day of the first month of Noah's 600th and first year. Is that significant that this is Genesis 8.13? Uh, you had that tower mega being 601 meters. I just... I just, yeah, I just I that. So <laughs> there's a clock tower... Well, it's a tower in Mecca where the clock itself is 187 feet, right? But the tower is 601 meters? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know, but maybe. I mean, it's just that, Stephen, you found that today or yesterday or something, right? Yeah. Okay. Today? Was it today? Uh. A day or two ago. Okay, a day or two. Okay, but in connection with what we're doing here. And we can see we're studying the first day of the first month from the, the tenth day from the first day of the tenth month to the first day of the first month. So we're gonna see that um, we're gonna have these uh, where is it here? So the waters abate for 150 days. Now I'm going to put this as from May 7th to, to September 2nd. So when you look at this uh, chart, if you can figure this out, there's where the first 150 days end, and there's where the next 150 days begin. That's going to be um, September 7th, right? You're going to see that you're going to start counting the 150 days. And then the 150 days is going to end um, here on um, uh, the first day of the sixth month. Is that how that's working? I'm trying to figure this out. Yeah, so this is going to be October 3rd. And then 
yeah, this is gonna be the first day of the first month. So I'm trying to figure out what I wrote here, if that makes sense. I think I kind of wrote that down wrong. Yeah, this should be October 3rd. I think that's a typo. Yeah, so I don't know how I did that because you wouldn't count, that wouldn't be five months, May, June, July, August, September, that's only four months. So it's October 3rd. So I had a typo in there. So it's, it's going to be the first day of the first month is October 3rd. So just to, to kind of get this in our minds, um, I have to go here. So maybe this is a little easier to see. So we have the 150 days that the water prevails, 150 days that the water abates. It's going to abate on the first day of the first month. That's when it's going to be finished. And But you're also going to have on the first day of the 10th month that the tops of the mountains are seen. It's going to be followed by 40 days and then by 21 days, right? From the first day of the first, uh, first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month is gonna be 120 days, right? So you can see this is obviously 30 days to make up the 150 days. Hopefully you can see that well enough. Okay, so we can see the first day of the first month to the first day of, or the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month, it occurs in the story of Ezra, right? And it also occurs in this story. Is that significant? Are we gonna just say that this is just some kind of coincidence and it doesn't mean anything? I'm just noticing that uh, yeah. it would be 77 days to end the Dove Ascent. Um, from where? From that 150. Okay, so so you okay? So what he's saying is, if we go from when the water uh, begins to abate, and we count 30 days. And then 40 days, that's going to be 70 days. The raven is sent first, but it doesn't return. The next Sunday, the dove is sent. And so that's going to be 77 days, is what you're yeah. saying. Okay. Yeah, then you have seven days and then seven days. So I'm just thinking about Jacob, because he's 77. Yeah. And then you have a seven-year period for Leah, seven years for Rachel. Rachel, so I don't know, just uh... well, no, I, I think you're correct there. So, so one is the 21 days is significant because it also this 21 days or 21 years exists in the story of the Babylonian captivity, right? Uh, so, so we end up with this period of 21 years that happens in in this staggering of these periods of 70 years. Um, and then we, uh, so it's going to occur also with these uh, decrees uh, and how they're, they're situated. It's going to be 20 years, but, but from when the decree uh, completes its work, it's going to be 21 years between Cyrus's and uh, Darius's. Um, you know, so Cyrus has a decree that they go back to Jerusalem. They start building the foundation. And so it's going to be 21 years uh, Less than 21 years between the two. Uh, let me see. How's it go? Yeah. More than 21 years between the two. More than 20 years between the two decrees. Less than 20 years from when they return. But if you go from when the decree is first given uh, to the dedication of the temple, that's going to be a period of 21 years. And and it's also with the periods of seven, 70 years. So um, so that's significant. Um, and 
So we got these periods of three weeks. So the dove is sent three times. Some people don't realize that um, when they read the story, but you get that when you read the spirit of prophecy, she makes this clear. And, and the last time the dove sent, it doesn't come back, right? So then they're still going to wait before they actually, um, you know, take the roof of the ark off. And then there's going to be this time period um, that the ground still has to dry, right? So they take the roof of the ark off. There's no more water, but they're, they're not really ready to um, go out uh, of the ark. So that's going to be another almost two months that they're still going to be in the ark. Um, now, as far as understanding some of the symbols, what about the 220? Do we have that in the story of Ezra? So the 220, we, we used to put in a different place. And, and I argued that that was wrong, um, that there is a 220 days in this story, but it's going to go from the time the rains begin to uh, when they see the tops of the mountains. That's going to be 220 days. Um, okay, what else um, about these 220? Do we have that in the story of Ezra? Anybody? Um, uh, you have uh, 59 days from when that last dove is sent out till the end of the 150 days. And uh, I think you have 59 years somewhere in, in the in the Greeks. Yeah, so that's what I was trying to figure out with the 59. Um, so I think from, from 516, from 516 to 457 is 59 years. Yes. Right, that's why it was 58 when we did to the dedication of the temple. So it's 59 years. Right, so that 59 years there is, is representing here in these 59 days. Right, so, so we have all of these symbols um, here. Now the 220, what was that again? Because that's in the story of Ezra, what's the 220? A nethanim? Yeah, so the number of the nethanim. Yeah, so just to try to find uh, the verse here for you. Um, yeah, so that's 820. So in Ezra 820, You have, and also of the Nethanim, whom David and the princes had appointed for the service of the Levites, 220 Nethanim, all of them were expressed by name. So, so the 220 Nethanim, we can, we can tie to this story of Noah as well. Now, I mean, sometimes you would think that at least the critics, every time you find something like this, they will just say, uh, well, you know, they put these books all together at the same time and they gave these number of days in the story of Noah to, um, to reflect that, you know, whatever they want to do, they can just say it's all done after the fact. The problem here with this is none of this is, could have been understood, you know, 2,500 years ago. Right. We are living in the only time in history where we could, with such precision, uh, figure these things out. And, and they're, they're, you know, extremely uh, compelling that, that these events that happened in the story of Ezra are symbolically connected with the flood. But also they, they fit historically. That is, I mean, we can confirm them objectively in the story of Ezra. It's harder to confirm them objectively here, though when I reconstructed this, so I know 
people don't fully understand how this came about this structure. This was a series of studies we did back in uh, what would have been 2014, I believe, 2000, so 2014, yeah, 2014 and 2015. So we had a Friday night studies and um, some people from my church who were interested in these things came and studied these things out with us. And we went through painstakingly um, trying to find the chronological fit of this story. And the only way that we could get it to fit was to do what we did. That is, when we tried to take a year of 360 days and 30 day months, it did not work. That is, on in a superficial level, people would say, oh, there's going to be 150 days from the 17th day of the second month to the 17th day of the seventh month. But if you do the counting that the way that it's in this story, that would have been 151 days if you use 30 day months. You, now, of course, they, they don't talk about how many months it is. They just say how many days it is, right? So it doesn't say five months anywhere in the story of, of the flood, but it does say 150 days. And it gives us two of these periods of 150 days. You can't take the 150 days of the water prevailing and the 150 days of the water abating and say they're the same period. And so in doing this, we found that the only calendar that worked was the biblical calendar and that it was an embolismic year, that it is a year that has 13 months. And we also could not get it to fit if we started the first day of the first month um, that's mentioned here. Well, it's, it's actually going to be the 17th day of the second month, and set, et cetera. We, if we took those and put them in the spring, the calendar does not work. That is, we couldn't get it to align right, with, with the year that we had for the flood. The only way we could get it to align was to start the year in the first day of the first month is the first day of the sixth month of Noah's 600th year. So, um, you know, because the months aren't all the same lengths, even though we say there's an average of 25, uh, 29.530587 days, months can vary quite a bit, you know, like 15, 16 hours. And, and that can affect quite a bit of if you're going to observe that month. And, and we couldn't do it with uh, the, the visible crescent either. So if we tried using the first visible crescent or if we tried using the full moon ways of doing this, the only way that we could get it fit, the only fit I found was to put the first day of the first month as the first day of the sixth month on the biblical calendar. And then all of the spans of time all fit perfectly. And the other thing that was significant is that the door of the ark is closed October 22nd on a Sabbath. And then also the doves are all and the ravens are sent out on the first day of the first month. So we have these weeks that line up per perfectly. So you're going to have the animals are going to basically it's six days, but, you know, the seventh day is going to. So they're going to start coming to the ark on, on the Sunday, on the first day of the week. And then, you know, when Noah gets into the ark and the door shuts, it's going to be yet seven days until it rains upon the earth so that means he's going to wait another seven days which means on the eighth day according to Ellen White that's going to again be um, that the rains are going to begin so that's actually going to be on the Sabbath right because the doors of the ark close so on the Sabbath God's going to actually give this rain and and it's going to rain for 40 days and then the water prevails for 150 days so that water gets to its height and it stays at that height. And then it's going to begin to abate. And, and 30 days after it abates, then you have the first day of the 10th month. They're going to see the tops of the mountains. Now, if we go to the story of, of um, the story of Ezra, we have this first day of the 10th month, but we have the 20th day of the ninth month. And the 20th day of the ninth month 
is, is just going to be 10 days, right? So there's going to be 10 days from when they meet at Jerusalem, make their confession uh, before they begin these divorce proceedings. And those are going to continue for 120 days, right? Yeah. Uh, no, they're going to, not 120 days, they're going to be for 88 days. Now, why do we have 120 days here? That's, that's the question. Because from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month is three months. So wouldn't this be 90 days? So why do I have 120 days there? Oh, you have it as an embolistic here. Yeah, so there's going to be a 13th month here, right? Which there isn't in the story of Ezra, right? So there's a 13th month. So I think that's rather interesting in this story. That it happens in an embolism, the year of an embolism. So you're going to have this 13th month. So it's going to be 120 days, not 90 days or 88 days from the first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month. Okay, so we have 120 days. What's the significance there? So if I take the 120 days and I multiply it by 20 days, 21 days, what number do I get? So you have the 21 days in there, that three weeks, and I have this 120 days. If I multiply 120 by 21, what do I get? 2520. You get 2520. Is that significant? Well, we would have to say yes, right? That that 21 days that exists within that period of 120 days. So there's all of these symbols that we have used in other places. They're all here in this story of the flood, right? that this, this story of the flood prefigures all kinds of other prophetic events and historic events. So the way birthdays are kind of, you know, it's not, as, not the same day every year. On our calendar. Well, I'm saying with Noah, at that their time, their birthdays would have been counted differently. Yeah, so we don't really know how they counted their birthdays. I mean, whether they would just, like, if you're born on the, you know, uh, certain day on a certain month, are you just going to observe your birthday that way on your biblical calendar? I would think so. I don't think they had solar birthdays. I don't think uh, they're going to count them on our calendar. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Yeah, so... Yeah, so their birthdays are going to be on different dates on our calendar, but the same date on their calendar. Okay, so, so you bring that up. For what, what's the reason here? Just to uh, clarify, just to bring up. Okay. okay, so there wasn't some, some significance here that we could apply. I mean, so we know this about the biblical calendar. It has these... Uh, um, these uh, different, um, you know, it, it, it gives us different dates in different years, and that can be confusing for people. But I think we're starting to grasp how that works. Now, so I want yeah. to go to, okay, okay your, uh, another comment, Stephen? Yeah, I was, I was just thinking about uh, Pharaoh's birthday mm -hmm. in the story of Joseph. Yeah. Uh, three full years. Yeah, being mentioned. So I'm just thinking, would that probably be, would that be the same date, or would they, they would count it differently, or would they, or would okay. that be two, two different dates in our calendar? Okay, so the Egyptian calendar uses uh, a year of 365 days. That is, they have 
uh, 12 months of 30 days each, and then five evil days at the end of the year. Um, and so they don't match it up with the solar calendar. They do it with um, uh, the rising of Cirrus. Right. So they use a star. So it's, it's actually a, um, because our year is called, um, uh, what's the name of our year again called? Um, cause we go from equinox to equinox, right. To count our year. What do you mean? The Gregorian calendar year? Well, our solar year. We go from equinox to equinox, um, right? So, you know, we think about a solar year. Uh, we do it by what we observe on the earth. Okay, so. See if I can, I, I put it in one of my papers, but I always forget all the terminology. So, um, so we have these different types of years. Uh, there's side ours is called a tropical year okay right now there is thing called a sidereal year so a sidereal year is based upon the stars okay mm -hmm. um so it's it's a different length of time uh, it's not it's not that different but it's it is still different right. okay. <laughs> So, um, yeah. yeah, so, so the aerial year differs from the solar year, the period of time required for the ecliptic longitude of the sun to increase 360 degrees due to the procession of the equinoxes it talks about here. Um, but anyway, it's uh, based upon an orbit of a stars, right? So that's how the Egyptians do theirs. So theirs is a uh, sidereal year. So it's a little bit of time, so but yeah. Those would, would have been pretty much on our calendar the same date. Yeah, so pretty much it's gonna, it's the birthday is gonna be roughly the same date. I mean, it might be a day off or something, depends. Right. Thanks. Yeah, okay, but that answers that question. Okay, so going back to, to this chart here. Now, what we're trying to understand is this first day of the first month to the first, or first day of the 10th month to the first day of the first month. And what, what we had talked about yesterday is this just seems like a long period of time. Um, if this is the divorce proceedings that are going to continue, um, are we going to say, well, this is gonna be, you know, seven plus years? you know, 2,640 days before all of this is completed. I mean, if we were going to take that as an actual date. And, and we know that what's happening is that the, the false doctrine has to be removed. Now, it could be, you know, that this is a period of time that God's given us to accomplish something. Um, but I... I don't think that we could wait until 2030 that this movement gets its act together. And any thoughts on this? And remember, you know, this is in the it time. It would be just 88 time. days. Well, yeah, but we're, not, we're not going to take 88 literal days and and put them in there, right? I mean, I don't think so. I mean, these are symbols, um, not something we would take literally. But but I know what you're saying. I mean, it'd be nice to say, well, in 88 days, you know, the group is going to have its act together. But, you know, the first day of the 10th month here, where he's, well, first, you know, there's going to be Pentecost. So we know that we've been looking that God has to bring us to the upper room. And, but we have this echo date, right? So that's why I'm saying that December 25th, 2021, Colin presents his study. 
on December 25th, 2022, um, you know, we're going to tie the 300 foxes' tails together. Um, and, and we have this period of time, January 11th, 2023. This is the period of time, I think, that this movement, this is in the time of wheat harvest, this is the time of Pentecost, that the work needs to be done. Right. So, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to say that, you know, we have to wait till 2030. And I, I wouldn't try to put like a period of time to it. I'm saying symbolically, we've been given this time, the end of Colin's prediction, and that that it must happen here. The upper room experience must happen here now. You know, if it happens in 88 days, that's fine. But um, so how are Brother Collins, that um that the May May of 2023 starts to 25 20 days, right? Is that is that is that yeah, if is you're that gonna count 25 20 days to April 5th, 2030? Yeah, to May. When we would go to May, I think Haran showed it yesterday that May was the uh, um Right in at May, May 21st, I think it was. Um, yeah, it was. I was just asking if that date had any significance. Well, see, see, what you guys are trying to do is not what I would do. I mean, I look at. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to do anything. I'm just asking the question. Yeah, I know, I know, but I'm just saying. So we we can count a date, right? So we count from April 5th. And we go back, you know, 25, 20 days, let's say. And we go to uh, May 12th. May 12th, right. Okay. Now, I mean, we don't know what that means, right? I mean, no, I didn't, I didn't say May 12th oh. is not a symbol that I know of. Um, I mean, I can look at it's the 21st day of uh, the second month. I could go one back day one back back one day ever earlier to May 11th, and that's going to be the 20th day of the second month on the biblical calendar. But it doesn't really tell me much. I mean, it doesn't. I mean, you know, I don't see how we can. Um, you know, we can't say that something has to happen by some date. When we have a symbolic date, like we need to look at the symbolic dates that occur. Um, These are all symbols. That's all I was doing. Yeah. But here, yeah, here there's no symbol that I know of. Right. So, so that's that's part of it. But, but I, you know, I understand, you know, we struggle with this. We, we look at this long period of time. But we have symbolic dates that are put there dealing with Pentecost. And that what we would have to say then is that a process has started. How long that's going to take, you know, only God knows. But we have to recognize we're in this process. We've come to the upper room. Um, we have our, a work to do within ourselves, right? Because we're not going to be able to do anything in anyone else. So we have work to do within ourselves of examining our hearts, seeing why this division occurs, what part we have to play, not the part someone else has to play. And, and this is, now there's a whole bunch of other symbols there, which we're going to address next week. But I mean, there's the burning of the father and the mother. Right. Um, you know, so that's going to be, um, story of judges right so there's all these different things that have happen and we have to be able to try to sort through what they mean Should, so they're going to burn the wife and her father with fire so it doesn't say the mother so that's interesting i just assume the mother's burnt uh so the philistines this is um judges 15 6 then the philistine said who had done this? And they answered Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he had taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. 
So how come they don't burn the mother? Now this is uh, the 156th ver uh, 1, 5, 6 prime. So if we take 15th chapter in the sixth verse, you can see this in the chat, um, equals 911. The 156th prime, so that's a, um, so 911 is a prime number and it's the 156th prime number, is that what you're saying? And it's the 426th book verse. Okay. So that's Iran saying that. So that's correct. Um, now it's um, it's also there were some other things about the verses as well. Because this is the seventh reverse chapter, so it's the seventh chapter from the end, and it's the which verses around? Or was that 15, uh, 15, 7? What was the question? Well, there was something about the number of the verses um, dealing with 777 seven, seven or something. Oh, that was something else I found with 300. Um, Gideon's 300 men is the seventh book, seventh oh. chapter, seventh verse. Okay. So Gideon's 300 men. Seventh chapters, seventh book, seventh reverse, um, reverse verse. Yeah, that's all of that's going forward for the three hundred. Okay, so anyway, the three hundred is tied to the seven, 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 and um, and this whole story here is tied to our history, but we don't know particularly what all of this means yet. We can safely say that we don't understand it. How's that? So, so we're going to come back to this next week. Um, and, you know, in particular, we know, well, we have the study with righteousness by faith tomorrow night and uh, Dwight's study in the morning. And then we're still uh, joining uh, with the American and Canadian groups this week. It's going to be the Canadian group. Um, the first Sabbath of, let me see, how's that working? Can't remember how it works. Anyway, it's going to be the Canadian group. So they must be the second Sabbath. I'm not sure how they did that. Uh, fifth, sixth. So it's first Sabbath, right? The seventh is, yeah, because they get the first and third Sabbath. So we're going to be uh, joining with, with them. And, and that's going to the upper room. And, and so if we want to be in the upper room, we need to be studying with, with uh, uh, these groups. That's my understanding. Okay. Um, yeah, there was this uh, Stephen making some comments um, about the 100 and 1,844 feet that you have in this, uh, these, I thought you said there was two buildings that have this, Stephen, where yeah, the, right. the observation yeah. decks are 1,844 feet. Above yeah, that's, that. uh, that's one of them anyway. Yeah, which is interesting. So Stephen's been looking at all these heights of these buildings, which is rather fast. Okay, so let's stop. Uh, Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. You know the needs that we have, um, and uh, you know the needs that this movement has. We pray for each person. We pray for those searching for truth. We ask that you can lead them and help us, Lord, to, to understand uh, the 
the things we study, that we can share them with others. Be with us now throughout this day and bring us together again to study your word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.